So I'm, I'm Scott Mears, I'm with Albert Agriculture, and come in closer so you can hear me. The, the, pers the person furthest back has to do a sweep net demonstration, so. <laughs> okay, so I'm Scott Mears, I'm with Albert Agriculture, based out of Brooks. And Ken's got my mic now, okay. Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Okay, okay, so. Ken gave me a list of 48 insects to cover. Um, it's not my intention to cover each and every one of them. So um, if, you're, uh, if you have a particular favorite that you want me to go, go over, certainly we'll, we'll cover it that way. I think the big one that I want wasn't even on the list, and that's Ligus. How many people think they have had trouble with Ligus in this area? Is it a problem? Yes, no? Daryl, help me out. It's here. I don't know that it's dust. Has anybody sprayed for ligus in this area in Canola? Years ago. Years ago? Not recently? Okay. We're going to go over sweeping for ligus and sweeping for for cabbage seed pod. We'll do them both together. And um, the reason why we'll do them both together because the timing is wrong for both right now. So. <laughs> so it's too late for cabbage seed pod weevil and it's too early for ligus. Okay. So. Um, this is, this is quite awkward to de demonstrate and hold this mic at the same time, but um, Daryl, can you, ad yeah. What do you want to do? Okay. I'll hold the mic. Okay, Daryl's going to hold the mic. Um, so a sweep net sample. This is a standard sweep net, three foot long handle, and this is a 16 inch diameter uh, net. That's the standard. Uh, if you're using something other than the standard, your sweeps do not mean as much. We can convert them, I guess, but you might as well just go buy a standard net. Now, is everybody familiar with our website, uh, the Pest Monitoring Network website? Uh, if you're not, um, go to Roping the Web. Top right hand corner, there's mul maps and multimedia. And just uh, click on that. You'll see the insect maps there. And any insect map you go to has a link back to our page. Okay, I'm going to refer to the page a few times. So. Uh, the reason that's important is because if you want to buy a sweep net and you don't know where to go other than UFA, does UFA still sell them? So go to UFA because I'm going to plug Daryl here. But there are, a, there are a list of suppliers for a sweep net, so you can go there. Um, the other thing on that page is we keep all of our maps current and we also have what's going on, what's hot, links to, uh, links to the insects that are hot at the time. So. Things like frequently asked questions about wheat midge when wheat midge was in season, that sort of thing. Okay, so a sweep net, a standard sweep net, a standard sweep is from your left hip to your right hip. That's 180 degrees. I'm going to demonstrate it. Then I'm going to pick on somebody, and I can't pick on Daryl because he's being so nice. So I'm going to pick on somebody to do a, a sweep, and then we're going to pick pick apart what you're doing right and wrong. Okay, does that sound fair? Because the this, this is the standard way to get your numbers for cabbage seed pod weevil and ligus. And if you're not doing this, you're just guessing. Because you can go out and you can always find a ligus on a flower or a ligus on a pod. And you say, well, I found a ligus, I'm going to spray. Well, that's not quite the right way to go about it. So, so we're going to spend some time on that. Okay. So left hip to right hip. The sweep is a moving sweep, so you're walking as you go. Okay. The sweep is meant to be in fresh material each time you go through the, through the crop. And why would that make any difference? If you sweep the same spot over and over again, if you're not good, like all the insects you're going to catch either what's there or they're going to fly away. Okay? So think about the general principle. It's you're meant to be moving, you're meant to get into fresh material each time, and you're meant to have that full 180 degrees. That's what the thresholds are based on. Okay? Now the common mistakes are people like to, no, they like to, but because canola is so much fun to sweep in, they, they get they power up and they do this, they start up high and they go wham like this, and they come up at the end again. And guess what? When you do that, you probably get a 70 to 90 degree sweep instead of 180. Okay? So that's the biggest mistake. The other thing we see people do is um, what's the other big one, Shelley? Help me out. I'm blanking out. It's either too deep. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so if you're sweeping for cabbage seed pod weevil, you want the top of the net right level with the top of the flowers, okay? 
because you're just knocking them off the flowers. If you're sweeping for ligus, first of all, you're sweeping at the end of flower and it's tougher to do, but you want about three quarters of the net in the crop if you can, but basically as much of the net up to three quarters. And the reason for that is ligus fly away, especially on a warm day like we're going to have later today, they'll, they'll fly away. So you want, you want some room for them to fly up and then you catch them in the net, okay? So a little bit subtle difference there. Um, the, the cabbage seed pod weevil, when you're sweeping for it, uh, the actual physical motion of the net through the crop knocks them off the flowers. And that's, that's why you want, you want to get as much of the flower in, uh, you'll have a, a range of flowers, you want to get as much of that into the net as possible. Okay, now, one last thing before we start. I said the timing's wrong for both. Whenever we talk a threshold, you also have to consider the time or the, the uh, stage of the crop. Wheat midge, we talk wheat midge. If it's the wrong time in the crop for, the, for, for, uh, for, for damage, the, the threshold doesn't mean anything. Same thing with cabbage seed pod weevil. Same thing with ligus, okay? In fact, the ligus threshold changes as the crop matures. So, so if somebody says they have so many uh, ligus, the big question is, what stage is your crop in? How far to swathing are you? If it's still in this stage, it's too early, okay? So crop stage and, and your numbers properly assessed, that's how you get to your thresholds. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's where we're going we're we're to do some sweeps and then, uh, then we're going to talk about that. A couple things I'll do. For all, all our official surveys, we put everything in a bag and then we label it and we count it back at the lab. I'm going to show you how to count things in the field as well. Uh, but if you're having troubles counting them in the field, simple Ziploc bag, label your bag and count it back at, the, back at your, your shop, your office, whatever. Um, you can freeze these guys and then they don't move so much, right? So once, they're, once, they're, once they're frozen, they're, they're dead, they're easier to count. So. So there's a couple little tricks. So we'll show you how to do that as well. Okay, I'm gonna do 10 sweeps. Um, I want you to critique whether I'm doing what I say I'm supposed to do, okay? Here we go. So a couple things you might have noticed, I'll just yell for a bit. A couple things you might have noticed is there's always, I try to get a little snap at the end of my sweep. You notice I come up out of the crop, a little snap, and I come back, okay? The snap is to try and knock things down so they don't fly out, okay? The other thing you might have noticed is uh, when I'm done, I do this. You're just snapping them down, get them down in the bottom, and then you can gather the net down here near the bottom. And that's for counting, okay? So this is, I don't know what we're gonna find, probably not a lot right now. The cabbage seed pod weevil are just about done. Here we have a little grasshopper, that's a two stripe. And this is normal, you should get plant material. So you bang this stuff off, move on, there's another little grasshopper. So knock the stuff off. Here we have a that's a horsefly, so he's dead now. Okay, so we're, we'll just work our way down through the material. And there's not a lot going on in here right now. Okay, here's a diamondback moth larva. Okay, here's a little parasitic wasp. I don't know what for, but it's a little wasp. And there is not much going on in here. Was this sprayed? Yes. When? Okay. This is a, uh, oh, here, here, the wee little things that look like little cigars walking around, those are actually thrips, okay? We don't really have a threshold for thrips in canola. We don't really usually worry about them. So there is not a lot going on. Would you use DDT? 
<laughs> so when did you say it was sprayed? I'm going to say two and a half weeks ago. Okay. Okay, so now does everybody remember the, the, the moth trapping we did for Diamondback early in the season? We said the, the risk was really low. This is a really low number of Diamondback. If we were if we were concerned about Diamondback, we would have a ball of them in there, okay? Because the threshold for Diamondback is at the end of flower, right up till swathing, around two to 300 per square meter, okay? That's 20 to 30 per square foot. That's a lot of worms, right? So these couple worms in here, we're not that worried about, and they'll probably, they'll probably be parasitized anyway. So, so we have no cabbage seed pod weevil, we have no ligus. So as far as insects are concerned, you're off to the races, okay? Okay, now I just want to show you, if you're having troubles counting things, you snap it down. <laughs> oh, great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so you can all come visit me in the hospital, right? I'm really sensitive, I get a headache right away, so I know you're you're lying, I'd be having a headache already. <laughs> okay, so, so just snap the stuff down, get that ball at the bottom, and then just turn it inside out right into the sweep net. Now, we do this for all of the field survey. Uh, Ken's technician did a bunch of these in southern Alberta for us this way. Did Ken did some too. <laughs> oh, I, was, I always, give, always give credit to the technician. Give, That's how you keep them happy. Okay, so give us other tips here. That's I'll great. Watch somebody else. <laughs> okay, I'll give you my tip right now. Okay, so this is, that's what we do for... So if I did this, then I would write on it uh, where it was, or Absolutely. the number, or, or something like that. And you guys all have smartphones now. You can turn your geo tag on your smartphone. So that means that every picture you take will give you your latitude and longitude on your picture. Then I'll hold it up right like that, so you can take a picture of it. Cool. Then you'll have what you wrote down on there, the GPS coordinate, and in the background, you'll see what stage you swept it at. So then you know if I was there in the right time or not. Perfect. Cool, eh? I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's so nerdy it works, right? Everybody can give me their phones and I'll show you how to turn that on. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, okay. So any questions on those two? Yes, Gordon. Maybe it's old. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not so much worried about into the sunlight, but because the wind never blows in southern Alberta, uh, with cabbage seed pod weevil, I don't really care which way you sweep. It doesn't really matter. But with uh, ligus, it's always good to sweep with the wind in your face because when they fly up, then the wind kind of holds them back. Okay. That's and then if it gets over, if it's so windy that you're having trouble standing up, then there's no sense sweeping anymore. So, but that's a great question. I'm not so concerned about the direction of the sun as I am about where the wind's coming from. For ligus, cabbage seed pod weevil, they they actually hunker down on the on the on the uh, the flower buds, and when you hit them with a net, you dislodge them. They they play dead as soon as they get disturbed, and they fall into your net. So they don't. It doesn't matter that much. Okay. And time of day is always the other question. Um, with uh, with uh, Cabbage seed pod weevil, pretty much any time of day, we find that if it's really wet, if the canopy is really wet, that we get lower counts. But otherwise, they're, they hang out in those flower clusters, and so, so it, it doesn't matter so much. Okay? So I had a question, yeah. if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, are there any edge effects with cabbage seed pod weevil and ligus and diamondback? Um, cabbage seed pod weevil, absolutely, especially early in the season. So. Let's go, let's, let's concentrate on cabbage seed pod weevil. We'll you bring me back to the other ones in a minute, okay? So, cabbage seed pod weevil, the rule is if you're the first field in flower, you're going to have the highest numbers in the countryside. It always works that way. I've yet to run into a year where the late fields have the cabbage seed pod weevil. It's almost, not almost, it's always the early seeded fields. The fun, ones that come into flower first have the highest numbers, okay? so. You're seeding early to get that head start on the season. You're going to get the biggest yields, probably, on average. 
but you're also going to have the highest cabbage seed pod weevil numbers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is they have a very strong edge effect. So up to about 10% flower, so when it just starts to get that nice yellow across, um, they're very much an edge effect. The longer we go after that, the more they spread out through the field. So uh, we have had people who have sprayed fairly early um, and gotten nice control by just spraying the edges. So absolutely, okay. Ligus, sorry. We move on out of seed pod weevils. Yes. What if, what if Laverne did a good job and sprayed at the right timing and, and his neighbor didn't? Um, what we're, we're, we're finding is that it, it more is about the timing of the flower and not what the neighbors are doing. So um, once they seem like once they get in the field, they don't leave again, unless, unless the field is uh, hailed or something like that. So they, they seem to stay there. No That's right. They're, they found where they want to be, they, they stick there. So we don't, after, after 15 to 20% flower, you really don't get any more cabbage seed pod weevil. You don't get much more in migration. It seems like that's sort of where they max out. So the nice thing about that is, if you're looking at fungicide treatments, it's the same timing, right? Okay, last thing. Yep, sure. Is there actually, like, I guess a measurable economic uh, impact by them? Like, are we talking five bushels, ten bushels? Is there something that's measurable? Yeah, yeah um, what, what they're doing is they're eating the seeds, right? Yeah. So yes, there is. Um, there's some debate over, over it. Um, we've been using two and a half to three uh, per sweep. And with the higher canola prices, we've been backing off to, to about two, but the line is not straight, okay? And I, I, I couldn't tell you the exact bushel losses. I'd have to go back and find, find the, the, the research, but the line's not straight. So if, if the canola price is doubled, that doesn't mean that one is your threshold now because it it's, tends to uh, level off. And the crop seems to compensate at the lower numbers and you actually get more seed production. Uh, from low levels of cabbage seed pod weevil. So one doesn't make any sense. One and a half, not really. I would not spray below two weevils per sweep on average, okay? And a lot of, and remember, thresholds are where your, your, your costs for control equal your returns from doing the control, okay? If, if you ran your fertilizer the same way uh, as as you run your as most people run their insect control, you would you would probably double or triple the fertilizer you're putting on. Because where where do you stop? Where do you stop your fertilizer? Two and a half, three to one returns, somewhere in there. So at two weevils per sweep, you're paying for your insecticide and your application. At at four, you're getting a two to one return. Okay, more or less. But it, remember, it's not exactly a straight line. What's the record? Okay. Um, I've, as far as numbers per sweep, yeah. I think the highest I've ever counted out is 25 per sweep or something like that. But that, that was in that was in the Lethbridge area about 10 years ago. So okay, we're pretty close to that this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at those levels, it makes perfect sense. I I I wonder at the. You didn't beat the record. No, well. 20 per sweep. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of weevils. I mean, that's an easy decision. Well, I didn't. So. I didn't count all 10 sweeps. Okay. Yeah, well, as long as you tell us how many sweeps you do and the count you got from it. So. I counted two sweeps and that was four. No bite. Well, after the ten, it was just like, yeah. I thought I was yeah. there. The, I was flying away. We'll talk to you about, for survey purposes, what we might do there. Just bag them and do the ten sweeps, bag them, and then we'll have our technicians. We'll, we'll uh, Did you, torture uh, our technicians. That was at our site. In Did you spray? Yeah. And then go back and check. Did it actually control what you wanted it to? Oh yeah, it did. Eh? Yeah, they killed everything, though, and that's that. That's the sad thing too. Yeah. We're looking at all of everything's dead. The ladybug, the, yeah. all the benefits, yeah. everything. Yeah, th there's nothing in here even now from your spray two weeks ago. So, yeah. So, Ken makes a good point. Uh, when you spray, you kill your beneficials. We don't have an important beneficial insect. In, uh, in the cabbage seed pod weevil, there are a few that are building up in numbers, and guess where that is? It's out in this part of the world. 
actually up up in the uh, up in the uh, Cypress Hills is where they first were found. There's a little little wasp that attacks the weevil larvae in the pod. So uh, those numbers are starting to climb a bit. So that's that's the good news. But so the more we spray, the more we hold those back, right? So if you don't need to spray, don't spray. Try to let those things natural controls build up. If you're at your thresholds, then that's a different decision, at or above. Okay, so one per sweep, absolutely not. Two per sweep is where you start getting, whether you're making that decision. At four to five per sweep, I don't think there's any question anymore. Okay? Dumb question, but no. what's 10 to 20% flower? <laughs> really that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know how I like to look at it is, I, 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 like, I like using, when that crop gets that nice yellow, that's, that's the latest you want to be spraying. And that's about where you're putting on, on your, on your, uh, on your fungicide as well. There's a much more technical answer. There's so many flowers on the thing. For uh, I had I had a pod picked out here for a reason. Um, the weevils actually start laying eggs on pods when once they're about three quarters of an inch to an inch long. Okay, and if if you if you're uh, if you let too many pods get developed, then the weevils will already be in them. So, so that's the other thing that you can do is you can look at it and say, okay, I got to get my spray on now because the pods are half an inch along already, the first one. And that happens fast. It's over a period of two, three days. So. There's also so. a blasting effect by them sticking their little beak in. Yeah. Some of the, uh... Yeah. So if, if everybody hear the question, the, the effect that you get where you get uh, the weevils feeding and, and you actually lose flowers. And, and that is, it's very clear from the research that that has no yield impact because what the plant does is just puts out more flowers. So the only place where we'll see a yield effect on that is when the crop is severely uh, moisture stressed. Okay. I guess so. one of the questions is if you get a really variable crop where you don't get the greatest germination and you've got stuff that's yeah. all different stages, how do you, like, where do you... Uh... You're going to find the weevils in the stuff that comes into flower first. first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Yeah, they're going to be in where the, the where the crop is is comes into flower first, and then they will move out, but they they won't leave the field. So you know, the, so the stuff that comes into flower later, they're going to move into that for later egg laying. So yeah, what you'll find is you'll find them concentrated in the good crops where it's growing well, and and then they'll spread out from there. So yeah, does that make sense to you? Okay. And, and this crop actually was it was completely stressed two weeks ago. Right. And it actually looked like it might start dying, and we got three inches of rain, and it turned into this. But it was flowering before that. It's been flowering for three and a half weeks. Probably. Right. Right. And so you've you've got probably some blasting of flowers from that stress too. So you get all this stuff going on, right? So. And, and if you look, I think at some of the, the branches and stuff like that, you can see where they're, you know, it made pods, and then there was some blasting happening, right. and then it started making pods again and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah. It never ever did really get that dark hue of yellow oh, throughout this whole right. time here. So you can tell there's lots of different sort of stages and stuff like that in. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I like I, I I always remember that you want if you think you're gonna have to spray, spray before those pods are an inch long, the first pods, because that's where they start laying eggs. So that's that's a nice rule. Um they they once they're in there, they're not gonna go away. They're gonna be there. So uh, they, they will, you'll see it go up to threshold on the edge and then back off as they migrate but further into the field. So, okay. You, you stepped in off the edge. Is that a good enough practice again here? Or should yeah. you wade more into the, like, two, three rounds? In? Yeah. Um, for cabbage seed pod weevil, it's fine. For ligus, it's not as fine. So sweeping the edge for ligus generally is a, it's decent. Uh, but if you want to picture the whole field, then you have to go deeper. For cabbage seed pod weevil, sweeping the edge will give you that, give you what the edge is doing, but almost without fail, further in is going to be less. So, so you know, uh, when we're doing our survey, we just walk into the edge and do that because it's consistent all the way through. But if you're making control decisions, you should be sweeping more areas. So in on a lease road, uh, if you're using tram lines, that gives you access to your field, stuff like that, yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Because um, now, Ligus, any other questions on cabbage seed pod weevil? We can move to Ligus. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a decent practice if you're if it's warranted. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's a decent practice if you haven't done your sweeps and don't know what's going on with the insects. Because then you're just you're just throwing insecticide into the environment for for you don't understand why. So um, it's it's a decent timing to control cabbage seed pod weevil. Absolutely. So does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Um, Ligus. Ligus um, do not tend to have an edge effect. They tend to be uniform through the field with some exceptions. You will always find more ligus in poor crops, poor parts of the field. Always. Now that might be because the sweep net is more efficient in the poor parts of the field because you can actually drive it through a good crop, the part of the good crop, it's hard to get that net into the, into the field. It also might be that there actually are more ligus there because ligus like that heat, that open, dry, heat part of the field and where the crops thin, they're going to do better. So probably a combination of the two. So um, ligus um, thresholds, if you go to the Canola Council site, you'll see that there's two sets of thres thresholds at the end of the flower and then near near um, near swathing, as you near swathing, you'll notice the closer you get to swathing, the higher that number is. And the reason, there's two reasons for that. As you get closer to harvest, the bottom pods toughen up, they can't do the damage there. And second of all, you have less time, okay? Now, we have absolutely no ligus to show you in this field, but ligus adults and fourth and fifth instar nymphs are the ones that do the damage. Before that, they're too small to damage your pods, okay? So how you tell a fourth and fifth instar nymph in ligus is they actually have a horseshoe. You can see where the wings will be. And it's really clear. And they're, they're about 80% of the size of the uh, adult ligus. So that's, that's generally how you tell it. And what we see is there's always a race between ligus maturity and your crop maturity. And, and more often than not, we just say, well, push your swathing and get it down so it toughens up and, and not spray. So that would be true out here. When we get into the foothills, we get crazy, crazy numbers of two or three hundred uh, ligus in 10 sweeps. So, so it's, it's a much easier decision for them. So what you're saying then is there's a disadvantage if you try and trace that? There may be, yeah, there may be. Um, the other thing, uh, just tying ligus and cabbage seed pod to weevil together, we see that guys that are spraying at that early flower for cabbage seed pod weevil seldom are spraying for ligus. Because the ligus, how, that, how ligus is working is they come in as adults in the early flower, they lay their eggs about that timing where you're, where you're putting, putting on for cabbage seed pod weevil. And when you spray for cabbage seed pod weevil, you take out the adult ligus, there's no eggs laid, you don't get ligus later, okay? Now there's some exceptions to that. If you're next to a hay field, they come in off hay when it gets cut in big numbers. Um, and if you're in the foothills, nothing seems to matter. You have ligus in the fall. So uh, we're not sure exactly. They're, they're different species actually out there than they are here. So we're not sure exactly what's driving those populations. So, yeah. Scott, when you get a variety of uh, instars and adults, can you do more interpretation of what, so when you, when you do your sweeps and you find uh, fourth and fifth and then adults and you're trying to count where the population is Does it mean anything or is it just they're all lagus and they're all the same? Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't call the count the little ones Basically, you don't I don't count and if they're not fourth or fifth in Stark I don't count them they're, they're But not, if they are fourth and fifth, but they're not quite that adult you still count them. You absolutely count the fourth and fifth in Stark because yeah. they are big enough and strong enough to damage the uh, to damage the, uh, the the pods. So, yeah. Okay. Anything else on Ligus? What am I missing? Gordon? Okay. 
Yeah, Ligus is more uniform through the field. Weevil absolutely starts on the inside, outside, and works its way in. Yeah. Any uh, difference yeah. to Scott irrigation dry land where you're, you're going to get more intensity? Yeah. Um, we tend not to see Ligus need to spray Ligus in uh, in irrigation because the little ones are thrips you're talking about. The wee wee little ones are thrips. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got a, some diamond back in there. Yeah. There's a yeah. few weevils, but not yeah. many. Okay. So why would my counts on Ligus earlier? Why would I see more Ligus on irrigation than dry land? Yeah, they and, and, they're, and it's not high, but it's, they're there. And they're higher in irrigation than dry land. They tend, they tend to come into the stuff first in flower. So again, probably there. But Ligus like hot, dry conditions, when we get that, that the heavy watering from irrigation, they, the, the nymphs get drowned. So the adults can withstand it, but the nymphs can't. And the ambient temperature can down. Yeah, that's right. So the temperature in the canopy itself is lower, so they don't do as well. So for the most part, we seldom see guys need to spray ligus in the fall in, in irrigated crop. Yeah. Okay, anything else on canola insects? I should probably move on, and I'm not going to pick on anybody with sweeping today. But With sweeping, I really want you to think I need 180 degrees. Keep your net in the crop the whole sweep, okay? If, you, if you're coming out, if, this is the most common. This, when guys sweep this, you see I'm only sweeping about 90 degrees. So keep it down there. Um, the other one last tip there is you can one-sided sweep. So you can sweep left, bring it back, left again, okay? If you're having troubles getting through the crop, it's tripping you up like it will, <laughs> um, then you can, you can step in between. And just, just remember, fresh material, 180 degrees, and drive that net through. Don't, don't, you're trying to score on Kipper Soft. You're not trying, you're not trying to, to just waft it into a soft one, right? Okay, so that's that. Scott, yes. Also, you want to keep the, the net moving if you hit a hole. Yes, yeah, so just you can actually, if you hit a hole in the field, you can actually pick the net up and just keep waving it around so nothing comes out. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay. I, I, I have a tickle trunk. Anybody, anybody ever watch Mr. Dress Up? I have a tickle trunk. So, anybody know what this is? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a birth armyworm trap. Um, if you want to know what the readings are here, I, never, I didn't look coming out. I should have. Um, but I think the moth catches are pretty low in this part of the world. Shelly, do you know differently? Okay. Shelly's gonna check for me. Anybody have an iPad they can check? So that's just on our website. You can go in and, but what this does is it tells us the flight. By the flight, we can tell you what the relative risk is for the area. So central Alberta, we have uh, about a third of our traps now are over the first warning level. And we have a couple now that are, are up into the second warning level. So there will be spraying in central Alberta for Bertha this year. In this part of the world, I don't think there will be because the numbers are really low. But that's what that's about. Um, we talked about diamondback moth. This is the diamondback moth trap. How these work is they have a, a pheromone in here. You see that little gray thing in there? So the pheromone attracts the moth, the male moth. It's a sex pheromone. The male comes in thinking that it's uh, fun times and they end up getting trapped. So any comments past that I'll leave to you yourselves. <laughs> um, but by doing that we can get a, an idea of the flight and by the idea of the flight we know what the relative risks are. So this spring we had virtually no diamond back in our traps. And now when we're sweeping we're seeing in 10 sweeps we'll pick up one or two diamond back moth. Nothing to worry about. Okay. So, but we report these early in the season and what, that get, what it does for us is it tells us what the flight was from the states because these guys do not overwinter in, in, in Alberta, okay? Generally, we can have a discussion about that, but that takes beer. Okay, anything else, anybody else, any other questions on canola insects? Um, Ken had flea beetles on his list. Um, what the flea beetles are doing right now is there'll be the odd one. You found a couple adults, but for the most part, the flea beetles are in their larval stage. They're feeding on the roots of your uh, canola. And um, then they come out about 
when you will be swathing as adults again. They do a little feeding and then they overwinter as adults. And then they, they move into your next year's canola uh, as it comes up. So, so that's that. How am I doing for time, Kim? You're doing all right, Aaron. Um, okay. 18 minutes. 18 minutes, approximately. Okay. So any other questions on canola insects? The big thing with flea beetles is you just have to be out scouting. Um, you can get an idea on your relative risk in your area if you see flea, flea beetles in big numbers and just pay attention year to year when you're swathing. If they're on your swather, hanging out on the back of your swather on the header, um, just make a mental note that what, what's going on there. If you're getting way more than you're normally getting, uh, over the years you'll learn that what, what, those, what the numbers you're seeing on your swather, what that means for next year. But remember that the ones that you see on the swather are the ones that eat your canola in the spring, your, your seedlings, okay? Because they overwinter as adults. So when we don't have a good way of forecasting uh, flea beetles, but you can actually, over, if you pay attention to what's going on at swath, you can get a read from year to year. Say, oh, way more flea beetles this fall, I better really watch my canola as it comes up next year. And you can do that on your own farm. Okay? Okay. Any questions? Maybe make a quick mention around the striped flea beetle. Yeah. So there are two major species. There are actually half a dozen others that we can find in canola, but there's two major species, uh, the striped flea beetle and the crucifer flea beetle. The crucifer is the all black one. Um, and the striped one actually has two kind of golden stripes on it. Um, and the striped flea beetle is, comes out earlier and is more tolerant of the insecticide treatment. The, the neonix, it is able to withstand the neonix a little bit better. So we have actually seen, I don't know so much about here, but at Brooks, which I would expect to be very similar, we've actually seen a shift from the crucifer, the all black one, to the striped, where to where the striped flea beetle now is the, the the dominant flea beetle in canola, so and that's driven by its ability to withstand the neonics a little bit better. Okay, so anything anything else? Can I ask your yellows and leaf yeah. hoppers or anything like that? Yeah. So um, the aster aster leaf hopper that that moves aster yellows around does not overwinter in Alberta. And so it needs to be moved up by south winds. And uh, the same south winds that bring up the diamondback moth, bring up the aster leafhopper. We had a very low migration this year. So the numbers are quite low. So we expect that there'll be some, there's always some aster yellows, but we expect it's gonna be a, a pretty much a non-issue this year. So, and it's way too late to do anything now. Is so. that leafhopper the only vector? That's the major vector. There's a half a dozen others, but the numbers of the other species are really extre extremely low. So, so the answer is no, it's not the only vector, but it is the important one. Okay. So we've, we've, I think what, what's happened is that that's a non-issue this year. And we would start to see it now. Actually, you start to see the purple plants and the deformed plants and plants that are have the witch's broom we would see that in this crop if it was around okay any others on canola we could talk about my last 20 minutes about aster leafhoppers but i this it was not was not a big issue in this part of the world and it's even lower this year so okay now leafhoppers you'll see them in the headlands you see them when they they look like miniature grasshoppers they're they're about an eighth of an inch long kind of a tor or, uh, wedge shaped. So you see them in the headlands. Okay, this is for wheat midge. Now I know wheat midge, that's the last thing I want to deal with. Now this, let's just go over to the wheat and I'll show you what I want to do here. Wheat midge, we're more concerned uh, earlier in the season. This, this wheat is well past being susceptible. Um, how many people have had wheat midge grading reports? Yes, no, you're seeing it in your wheat midge grading? Is it, is it costing you a grade or just a mention? It costs you grade? Two grades. Two grades, okay, so that's a lot. Is that in this area right here? Yeah. Okay, okay, anybody else? We've seen it, but it's got enough other stuff that we kind of make it work through, right? Okay, okay. So, wheat midge is a tiny little fly that lays its egg 
on, on the uh, developing head uh, of the wheat plant and the, that, that hatches into a little maggot and the maggot crawls down onto the developing kernel and eats on the current kernel, okay? Now one midge will cause a, a little dent, two or three will cause a big, big dent and some deformity, but you can have up to half a dozen uh, little maggots on each kernel, okay? And then if you get up into that range, then you start to get no wheat kernel at all, okay? So it is, wheat midge is capable of completely taking the yield from a crop if the numbers are bad enough. Now we're not in that range yet. Um, it's, it's, it's new to this area. Um, so how do we know we have wheat midge? We do a, an annual survey uh, through, through the entire province. What did we do last year? Over 300 soil samples. And we actually take the cocoon from the overwintering stage and count them. Okay, so we wash them out. I say we, Shelley washes them out of the soil. Um, the other thing we started this year is this midge trap. So again, we put a little pheromone in here, a uh, sticky card in the bottom, and uh, we put this in the crop at flag leaf, and we can actually see the midge numbers start to climb. Okay, so what that tells us is when it's time to scout. Okay, scouting for wheat midge is lots of fun. Right? Have you scouted? You've done scouting for wheat midge? So how, how we scout is we actually just walk out into the crop and, and uh, in the evening and watch for the midge flying around in the crop. And it's so many midge per 10 heads. So in this area, or with our current prices, probably about one per 10 is, is where you're, you're going to get uh, grade loss. If you get two per 10 heads, then you're, you should be spraying because you're going to get yield loss. Okay? So, um, so it's a simple matter of those of you who like to drink beer, take a case of beer and you walk out into your crop, you set your case of beer down, you take out a beer and you sit on your case of beer and you actually just pick 10 heads and, and count the number of mids that are flying around. Okay. That's the scouting. That's how we do it. Okay. Um, now it's, it seems like that's, that's uh, um, not a very efficient and it isn't because how many fields can you do right at dusk uh, by sitting and watching them? You have to pick your fields. So we'll go through that in a bit. Okay, so. So um, we're, we're suspicious of particular fields. Now, how are you gonna pick which field you're gonna concentrate on? Any ideas? Exactly, right? So you've got a problem. So this was your wheat field this year. Next year, that's wheat. That's where they're going to be, is adjacent to where you had trouble. So you take your fields where you had midge grading reports, and you concentrate on the fields around them, okay? So that's the first step. Fields that tend to be wetter, uh, so the low-lying fields, fields with higher organic matter, which is not, you don't have very high organic matters out here, but those fields that tend to hold more moisture will have more midge. Midge like wet conditions. So you've had a series of wetter, wetter-ish years for you out here, and that's why midge has done so well out here. Okay? When do you, when, remember my opening pep talk? Every threshold has a timing. What's the timing? Okay? Midge will lay eggs and be successful in laying eggs on on wheat any time the head's showing. So from the time the head, often the wheat, uh, just before it heads out, it'll, you'll see the head through the boot, side of the boot. It's susceptible from that stage to anthesis, okay? Now there was a couple here with anther, anthers on them, but the anthers are just those little whitish yellow things that pop out of the, out of the wheat head, okay? So when your crop is, has passed anthesis, and you haven't reached your threshold, you're clear, okay? Now, why is that important? Because you, if you can seed your wheat early enough to get it through anthesis before the midge fly, you will not have to spray. So that's, that's one thing you can do. If you go out in your crop and you see anthers only in the middle of the head, what does that tell you? You see an anthers only in the middle of the head. 
No. That means it's just started flowering. It's just started flowering. Exactly right. So wheat flowers or goes through anthesis from the middle of the head to the tops and the bottoms, okay? If you go out in your crop and the anthers are only at the tops and the bottoms, it means that it's through anthesis and these ones in the middle have dried up and blown away. Because you never get wind here, right? But they do blow away. Okay, so that's, now, what you're gonna find is your main heads will be through anthesis and your side, your secondary and tertiary tillers will still be in, in anthesis. So then it becomes a judgment whether or not there's enough yield in those, those secondary and tertiary tillers to make it worthwhile spraying. It's not a cut and hard, hard and fast rules on it. You're gonna have to make a judgment call, okay? If you get past anthesis and then your numbers climb, the wheat is actually with able, able to withstand those uh, eggs and they actually kill the larvae, okay? So it starts to produce ferulic acid and the ferulic acid kills the larvae, okay? But it's not doing that until it's through anthesis, okay? So it's uh, critical to understand where you are in your crop. So your first wheat in flower is the first places, or first wheat starting to head out. That's where you're gonna start scouting your higher risk fields based on where the damage was last year. That's where you're gonna concentrate, okay? Because um, you're not gonna be able to go out with your case of beer because by the time you get to the third field, you can't drive anymore. So, <laughs> so no, I, the case of beer is just a fun thing, but. Take lots of spray for the bugs. Take lots, because you're, you're gonna have the odd mosquito, right? Yeah. If you get a certain number of beer, you have to divide the number of bugs you see by the number of bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, that, it might be over. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, yes, Gordon. For those who haven't seen you before, though, they might look at that other little... Yeah, so, so there's two orange-colored things. Um, there's a, the loxanid fly. It looks like a house fly. The midge looks like what? Mosquito. Looks like a mosquito, a small orange mosquito. And it really is orange and they hover just like a mosquito, okay? The, the loxanid fly is kind of a dirty orange and it's bigger and it looks like a horse, house fly. So you can, you can make the distinction there. The midge is not active during the day. You cannot find them during the day, okay? So it has to be done in the evening. There's no shortcuts there. Um, the other thing I would do is if you're suspicious and you're not sure what the, the emergent status is, use a sweep net. You don't have to stop and look carefully. You go out as the sun's setting, hit it with a sweep net, look for little orange specks. If you're finding little orange specks, slow down and do the counts. If you don't find the little orange specks, go to the next field. Keep moving, okay? Because I, I know you all have more than one field of wheat, so uh, you probably have like 30 or 40 fields of wheat that you have to get to. So you're gonna prioritize, you're gonna do some shortcuts. What we're finding with the trap is uh, it's early on, but we've got a pheromone now that works, and we're uh, we're going to uh, we're going to try to fine tune it. But it looks like we can use the traps to tell us when the flight's on. So, Scott, is there any relationship or correlation between heat unit degree days uh, to midge? Absolutely. So, yeah. And is it different than what the experience is in Manitoba, North Dakota, to here in southern Alberta? Because our heat units will be somewhat different when they're going to arrive. Yeah, um, we're not exactly clear because nobody's done the work on correlation, but we're using the Saskatchewan model okay. for heat unit development. So, so if, if you want to do it on a, uh, an al analytic basis, then you could do yeah. growing degree days to get you to where you better start looking out because you've yeah. accumulated the heat units and degree days. Yes, so absolutely. What Daryl's talking about is, is heat unit accumulation and midge development. Um, absolutely, there's a correlation, and we're using the Saskatchewan model. It looks like it's good. So um, we are we are working on, and Alberta Agriculture has a very extensive weather net, weather reporting network. We're working on marrying that with the heat unit development. And by next year, if all goes well, we're going to have a midge development map that you can marry with your your visual look at what your wheat's doing and make the decision whether you should be scouting or not. So, and then we. We hope to go with this and have all three kind of working together. So, does that make sense? Okay. There's a pretty small window to spray and it's, and it's specific mm -hmm. times and stuff like that too. Yeah. Um, so, 
there's uh, there's two products you can use, um, uh, but everybody uses the lower bound the, the clopyrifos type products because the uh, the lower bound type products uh, kill the eggs as well. So it gives you a little bit wider window, right? So um, when you see your numbers. If you've been scouting all along and you see your numbers, then you've got three to four days to get your application on. So it's, yeah, it's pretty tight. Yeah, yeah. But if you haven't been scouting all along and you don't know that, that two days ago there was very few, then you don't really have a good idea, right? So that's the problem. I, I found them last year. Actually, I think Shelly did some counts on a field for us over here. Okay. And So that's that's big. That's big. Yeah. And then a grade pass around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of your wheat goes out the back, right? So yeah, Shelley. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. We, we've we've had a little bit of issue out in this part of the world with us because we don't ask permission often. We just go find a wheat field and sample it, and we've had a couple of farmers not happy with us doing that. So. So if you want us to sample your wheat for midge, uh, get a hold of us and Shelly will do her best to get, we'll, we'll do a half a dozen in, in Cyprus, a uh, half dozen fields. So. Uh, what was the other product? Other product is a dimethoate type products and yeah, and, and they, they don't kill the eggs. So nobody's using them and I wouldn't recommend them because if you use the product will kill the eggs, then you have a wider window and, and better control. Resistant yes. Forest. Yeah. So that that actually, there's two things I would do if you're fighting midge, seed early and get get one of the midge uh, tolerant cultivars, because it, what it will do is it'll just bring down that level, and um, they're they're good, um, and they they work, um, and just if and if you if you're just getting grading reports. I would get two or three varieties and test them out, see which one works better for your, for your farm. But absolutely, uh, midge tolerant varieties are, are the first line of defense. Second, I would seed your wheat as early as possible, try to get ahead of the midge. And then third is then scouting and spraying if you have to. So. Does it also impact durum and barley? Absolutely, durum, absolutely. And durum, we don't have midge tolerant varieties and Durham is susceptible much longer time frame. So it's, it's, it's a problem in Durham that we don't have good answers for yet and they're probably gonna end up spraying. Um, barley, they can complete their life cycle in barley but we're not getting yield losses and grade losses, so. Okay, they prefer wheat. Okay, I'm sure I've used more than my 45 minutes. Okay. Yes, Gordon. Cereal leaf beetle, I'm seeing more of that. Okay. Not, not uh, damaging levels, I don't think. Yeah. But I'm finding even the little slugs when I'm shooting. Yeah. So it's, um, cereal leaf beetle, and I think um, I think we probably should be talking, have insect talk in the winter, and we can go into detail some of these things. But certainly the numbers are climbing. Uh, we have a lot of guys that get excited about spraying for cereal leaf beetle, but we need one per one per stem on average, and there's, we found a couple fields down by Tabor for uh, Vauxhall this year that needed to be sprayed. Now, cereal leaf beetle and wheat midge both have natural enemies that will help control their numbers, and um, if we don't need to be spraying, we should be allowing the natural enemies to build up. And you'll hear me say that again and again, but cereal leaf beetle especially in most parts of North America, they don't spray anymore because of the beneficial insects, okay? So they just keep them down. But if we, sp if we have to spray, we have to spray. But if we don't, let the natural enemies work. The same thing happens with uh, wheat midge. There's a natural enemy that does a really, really good job. Central Alberta had midge first and they didn't spray much up there. And now we see only background levels of midge in Central Alberta. So we're on the we're on the bleeding edge here. This is a new new invasion. This part of the world, and if we can hold off spraying when we don't have to, then we're going to see we're going to see the natural enemies build up and and keep it down as well. 
And the uh, natural enemies work really, really nice with the tolerant weeds. So I can have, we, we should have about a 20 minute talk about tolerant weeds because there's some management issues there. But. Okay. Well, join me in thanking Scott.